Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and today I have my July wrap up. July was a month in which I entered another reading slump. I had grand plans for the books that I wanted to read and it was going to be this month of fairy tale and religion and I really was just see seeking out weird absurd books for the month and for the most part that's what I got and I can say that there isn't a single book that I disliked this month. So on the one hand I have been successful in terms of the media that I consumed but on the other hand it wasn't to the amount that I wanted to get read. I think it was entering into July I still felt this small wave of sadness that was slowly dissipating but had been present the month before and I still hadn't properly got rid of it so that I was reading more slowly. But did my slower reading end up that I thought more critically and was able to enjoy the books more? I don't know, but the first book that I read in July was Pet by Ekweki Imezi. Originally I didn't plan on reading this book after not having the best experience reading Freshwater by the same author last year. However, I saw this book recommended by Jesse over at Bowties and Books and I felt like they talked about it in such a fashion that I couldn't help but want to read this fairy tale. This is very much a modern fairy tale and I don't want that to simplify what this book is about. I feel as though this is like classic children's fiction which has great messages hidden beneath the surface. There is a lot in here that adults can get as well as children. This is a book that speaks to a lot of people. It is about a young trans girl called Jam who lives in the city of Redemption and monsters were removed from this city years ago by angels. One day Jam ends up releasing a monster called Pet and Pet immediately says that a monster has, is present in Redemption which Jam doesn't believe because the monsters were eradicated and this book talks in a great way about if we refuse to discuss history, does that then not allow history to repeat itself? The characters are well drawn with great representation of trans and queer identities. We have disabled rep in here and also the book is written in a incredible style that seemed reminiscent of classic storytelling, oral storytelling. I would very much like to hear the way that this book is spoken because I think that there is a very strong narratorial voice. I really liked the character of Jam and their family and their family dynamic and the way that they work together. I felt like this story was very short, very simple and to the point but with a lot of hidden meaning and even though I felt like a lot of that hidden meaning was easily accessible and you could look beneath and figure out what was happening before the characters had figured it out. That's me saying that as an adult reader. Um, I don't know how it would be for a younger reader that this is aimed towards. I still feel like there is a lot more to go back and unpick and unpack from this novel. It's definitely worth a reread and I just think that the author has done a fantastic job and this isn't something that I expected when I read Freshwater and I think I will be going back and reading that book as well as reading the author's latest novel The Death of Vivek Oje because I think that I might have gained a new respect for the author from this book and would like to give their works a second chance and I think that if you are looking for a highly moralistic magical tale and then this is one for you. Next we move on and I read The Bone Clocks by David Mitchell. This is a book that is, spans six decades and begins with Holly Sykes in the 1980s. She is a teenage runaway who after an argument with her mother related to her new boyfriend decides to leave her childhood home. 
but in doing so this sets off a chain of events that sees her coming across horologists, horologists, horologists. I still haven't got that word down, but basically they meddle with time a little bit. And in each subsequent chapter we go to a different decade and they're not always told from Holly's perspective and can be about another character but you can guarantee that Holly is going to turn up. I think that Mitchell did a great job of capturing each decade he was writing about. Of course having multiple characters I after Holly Sykes being such a strong character and making me read really quickly through the first chapter to then change that in the second chapter and introduce me to a character that I really did not like, um, slowed down my reading with this one. But I enjoyed it. I still am unsure about the final chapter. I'm not sure how that fits or whether it added anything new to the story, but it did give an air of finality and I think that that might have been necessary. I'm conflicted about that final chapter but I did really enjoy this because it was this blend, it felt like literary science fiction and I can appreciate that. I really like the writer's prose and the way that he creates the world. I have read books before that have tried to blend literary and fantasy and they haven't done it well because they haven't felt like taking the plunge into either. This felt accomplished and this felt as though the author knew exactly how to tread both lines without it ever feeling too liter literary and too smart and it was just brilliant really and I'd really look forward to going back and revisiting this one in future. I think that Holly Sykes is still my favourite character from the book and it's a I'm glad that she was the main character in the beginning. I still don't know how I feel about all these men then getting the opportunity to tell Holly's story but then at the same time I feel as though that means that the more boring aspects of Holly's life don't have to be talked about and we can get the interesting aspects of other people's lives and just have her turn up and be a part of their story as well as then telling her story and showing where she is at this point in time. I also feel envious of the writer's talents. I don't know how he manages to create these worlds in these books and I like the links to some of his earlier works. Uh, seeing that as someone who's only come into his books this year, I look forward to reading more of his other works and getting to see those easter eggs in each one. There's a great essay at the end of this about why David Mitchell reintroduces characters and I appreciated that. Um, because I feel as though it gave me more knowledge of what the writer was trying to do. So ultimately this might be my favourite David Mitchell that I've read so far. It felt like the most accomplished which it should do because it is, I believe this might have been his sixth novel, I'm not sure, but either way he should have improved by this point. He did and I was a fan of it. Next we move on to Slade House which is apparently connected to the Bone Clocks. I did notice that this book is creepy. This book is scary and after the first chapter I had to put this book down and it was not the thing that I should have read before going to sleep. I'm still not sure how I feel about this book because even though David Mitchell did manage to keep this sense of creepiness throughout and I was still somewhat horrified, I just felt as though the chapters ended up getting a bit samey because they felt as though they were getting the same resolution at the end of each chapter. However at the same time as someone commented that added to the horror of them um, that added to the horror for them because this sense of inevitability felt like things could never change and the, the horror at the core of this book was going to be allowed to continue going on. I got through this a lot faster than I did The Bone Clocks. I found it a very quick accessible read and this one felt more like a horror story. I feel like this would be a great book to read on its own around Halloween if you were looking for a weird horror read then this would be the place to go for that. Each felt like different stories as has been documented with all of his books. Everyone follows a different character and this time it's just that they're all connected by this house. I think that he still forms characters really well and that's one of the things I have liked in every single one of his books is the way that he's able to craft character and so yeah I enjoyed it but similar to the bone clocks it leaves me with questions as to my overall opinion and in doing that 
causes me to think and mull them over more. The next book that I read, I read all month and this was a buddy read with Amelia Reeves and that is The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov and this one was translated from the Russian by Michael Glennie. Before I went into this book all I knew was the devil, an overweight cat and I thought that it was the Margarita originally and that the Margarita was a title. It isn't. Margarita is a person and me and Amelia Reeds are still trying to wrap our heads around this book. It's everything I thought it would be and I can see where it has influenced more modern pieces of media related to the devil and related to storylines of this ilk. I am sure that uh, throughout the reading of this novel I would comment to Amelia that it reminded me of 1950s thrillers in tone and I felt as though I could see the inspiration behind certain scenes in that. Indeed there was a film I was watching earlier this year in which a doctor was drugging the only person who knew that he was a murderer and in this book we see people who have seen the devil being institutionalised. I don't think that me and Amelia have yet properly figured out everything that was going on in this book but I have to say that I really did like the fact that this book was so absurd and so out there. I'm not sure whether there is one central character in this book or whether we're seeing an entire community. I've heard that this is actually a criticism of something. I can't remember what it was a criticism of. I will be leaving a link to Fwan's video on this anyway because I watched that after reading this to try and give me some semblance of understanding and it helped me a bit. Yes, but for the most part, I, I enjoyed this book. I'm going to keep it. I think that buddy reading it helped me out because it meant that if I was questioning things and Amelia was questioning things as well, then at least we could go to each other and be like, I'm not getting this at all. Unfortunately, we weren't able to help each other out and make sense of it, but we did come up with some interesting theories and I am grateful for the experience of both reading this and getting to share my questioning with somebody else. A book that I am not going to talk about that I read the archive in July and then reread at the start of this month is The Miseducation of Evie Epworth by Mattson Taylor and I will leave a link to my review of this in the description but do know that it's one of my favourite books of the year. And another book that I read is After Dark by Haruki Murakami. This was gifted to me by Emily of Novel Novels and I have recorded a review of it though I haven't edited it yet. So therefore what I will say about this book is that it is told in supposedly real time over one night and Mary is, or Mary, is in a cafe in Japan when a boy goes over to her and starts interrupting her as she's reading. Side note, what a dick move. And during that night you get to learn that her sister Eri, have I got that? Yeah, her sister Eri is in, has been sleeping for two months and they're unsure what is happening with her and then she gets taken, then Mary ends up getting interrupted again and taken to a sex hotel because they need a translator for a Chinese girl who has been assaulted there. It gave more of a sense of Japan as a whole as opposed to the usual tourist idea of Japan that we have. And also might be the first time I have read a Murakami book and thoroughly enjoyed the experience. It felt like I was reading a thriller. I know that the author really enjoys Raymond Carver's work and I finally got to see that here. The conversations in here were quotable. I still have plans to go back with my sticky notes wherever they are and just highlight some bits because I feel like this tatty edition and I'm very glad it is tatty and has been read a lot because it feels like I can beat it up a bit now. Um, so thanks Emily for that. There were absurd moments in here and it is exactly the sort of thing that I could see the Coen brothers adapting into a film. Obviously I don't know many other directors or writers otherwise I will be mentioning Japanese directors and creators here. However if there are any similar to the Coen brothers that you know of let me know. I would love to see this turned into a film. It's written in this way as though we are being shown the entire story through a lens 
And I feel like that lent to this whole thing of we can never truly know what's going on under the surface with a person. And it was just a fantastic story and I'm glad to have been introduced to it. And them's the books. If you have read any of them and would like to discuss them, then please feel free to do so in the comments below. If you have read The Master and Margarita and know what was going on, then please get in touch with me so that I can try and figure it out for myself. I hope that you have enjoyed this video and until next time, that is all.